big thank you to all our three presenters for three fascinating presentation and actually really talking to the topic of the panel. Uh, at this point, the floor is open for questions and comments. And as always, you do want to briefly state your affiliation before you start questions. Who would like to break the ice? I have a hand there. Hi, my name is Sophie Fru. I'm from the University of Greenwich. Um, I just had some questions, particularly for Uslim and Alyssa. Could you talk more about the policy implications, particularly the things you've tried to talk to policymakers about, and, and also whether countries can move between the regimes that you've um, outlined in your papers? Thanks for that. Who would like to go next? Sorry, the, the people, ha, yes, by all means. Um, hi, I'm Manya. I'm from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, my question is for uh, Mark Setterfield. Um, and um, I was wondering, like in view of the empirical evidence on the elasticity of factor substitution, um, which suggests that, in fact, Sebastian Gershert, who I think is here, has a survey paper on the elasticity of factor substitution, which suggests that the lower bound is like 0 0.3 for the elasticity of factor substitution, and the, on average, it's estimated at 0 0.9. Um, so in view of this, what is the reason for um, heterodox economists to favor the Leontief production function, which requires that the elasticity of factor substitution should be zero? Thank you. Thank you. The floor is still open for questions and comments. It, it is the case that these spots are quite intense, so I may need a, a few seconds to see a hand. Yes, there is someone to the right. Thanks. I would like to ask Özlem uh, if she has some works to suggest on uh, market concentration and financialization on the relationship between Thanks. Yeah, so, so, Özlem claims that she actually understood you, but in the middle I did not uh, acoustically understand you. So can you repeat the, the second part of the question? If she uh, has some uh, studies on uh, financialization and market concentration to suggest. Okay. I saw another hand, but it has disappeared again. Jan? Um, Jan Prive, Berlin. Um, I have a question to Mark. Um, I didn't quite understand your laundry list and the idea to focus on the supply side. How can you focus on the supply side without any environmental uh, issue addressing and without finance? So what, what are your criteria for choosing the laundry list uh, that... Um, the list that you want to buy or, or to, to put in your huge complex model? Yeah, I think we can take two more or so questions for the first round. As there's hesitation, of course, I'm happy to volunteer and contribute the question. Uh, I, I have a Maybe a stupid question to Elisa, but why is it a structuralist feminist and not a post-Keynesian uh, feminist model? And that's not just because I want to hear how great post-Keynesianism is. I, I'm specifically wondering whether the term structuralism and post-Keynesianism has some, different, some sort of different meaning in the, in the US and in Europe. Because when you say structuralism, you don't mean prebish. It's sort of probably some new school mediated structuralism. I, I thought it would be Lance Taylor. So, 
Yeah, the, exactly, Lance Taylor, that's what I saw by news code. But uh, sort of a lot of, the, the, sort of in your paper you're saying it, it's growth models where distribution matters for growth. Yes. So in, in that sense, in a European terminology, I wouldn't have considered that structure. So I, I wonder whether that's just a label or whether there's something in it for us to think about. Okay, any, any other questions for the first round? Yes, I have Joe. Anyone else? Then Joe, you have the last word for now. Thank you, Joe Michel, uh, UE Bristol. I can't resist asking Mark, can we reconcile the supply side, the demand side, and climate and ecological constraints? That's a, what we call efficiency, a short question that will take hours to answer, yeah? Okay, with that, I hand over to the panel, and as always, in, in such a plenary discussion, you pick from the questions what you think is useful for the overall discussion. I suggest for this round we go in the order of presentations, and Elisa starts us off, and you may have to switch on your mic. Thank you. So, in terms of the... Um the, po the policy implications. Uh, I think a key focus initially when we started this work is, you know, and I've talked to, to some folks here about this, is that from a development perspective, gender equality as a goal of development policy, and it's in the SDGs, has become sort of mainstream. Uh, and one of the uh, pathways that is emphasized over and over is increasing women's labor force participation, uh, because that's a very easy way to raise economic growth. You're shifting their production from the non-market to the market sector. Uh, but there's no consideration of what the implications of that shift are. It's not when they're. It's not as if when they're not in the working in the market sector, they're not producing anything. Uh, so a key focus is to try and bring forward the importance of the the care economy, whether that those exchanges happen in the market or outside of the market two goals of economic growth and to capture the potential um, negative aspects of that and to encourage a development of a publicly provided social welfare regime that takes seriously the demands of care. It also, um, there was a, uh, a paper that I wrote for UN Women which took more of a case study approach to this framework and looked at uh, particular groups of countries as differentiated by economic structure, which is a key right uh, way, I, uh, maybe, I, you know, I think in terms of being a structuralist, an important aspect of that for me is right, is that the relationships of economic growth are of course determined by the distribution of income, but then it also moderated by different types of economic structure. So living, looking at different groups of countries and characterizing their, the interactions between the uh, organization of social reproduction and the uh, relationships of economic growth, and particularly looking at its changes over time and some of the constraints or potential ways that um, different aspects of these structures might contradict one another. So. Uh, Another way of exploring this work, and I think it's uh, particularly powerful, is you doing a case study approach and sort of thinking about what different ways of organizing social welfare regimes and how they interact with different macro policy stances, and then what the consequences are for development and growth. Oh, about structuralists versus post-Keynesianism. I think, you know, I don't really know the answer to that quite, because I think I agree with what you said in the sense that, you know, I, a, a key defining feature of the model, or at least our starting point, and why we started with the baduri marglin model, for instance, is because of the distribution of income determining aggregate demand and um, other macroeconomic right uh, consequences, but that so it seemed 
uh, natural to apply to different sources of inequality, right? So, but I don't really, well, I think, I don't know the answer with like why we don't use the term post-Keynesian versus structuralist. What do you think about that? I, I personally, I think the, 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 the term in the American context is associated very closely with the work of Lance Taylor. Yeah. And the structure of Lance's work is often recognized as being Kaletskian. And of course, one of his yeah. main students, mm -hmm. Amitava Dutt, went on to explicitly embrace that language. Lance himself never did, and uh -huh. nor did a number of his students. So I, I would say it's a sort of rhetorical difference. But you're right that there's obviously a, a source of confusion here if people are used to associating structuralism with some of the Latin American contributions. Uh, although, of course, Lance himself was very involved in Latin America, and that may be another of the reasons why he, he preferred that language. May I answer this question? Too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when I write to heterodox uh, economics audiences, I do use explicitly post kaletskian because that means something to you. If I am speaking to policymakers yeah. or explicitly mainstream, uh, hostile or not hostile, uh, but certainly not aware of uh, who Kaletsky is, uh, type of people, uh, or university management, uh, to post Keynesian, post Kaletskian, anyway, since they don't know, they feel very ignorant and then uh, that, that creates a negative response. If you say post Keynesian, that sounds like what is post here and Keynes, this is ancient history, not novel. They're only looking for change and new. Or if you're talking to us, just World Bank economists, really. Using structuralist is very helpful. Who doesn't want to be structuralist? I mean, all you're saying is structures matter. Markets, imperfections, market pricing, market power matters. Uh, export, import structures, structure of your economy, who, how much of which sectors, uh, oligopolistic structure, gender composition uh, is a structural element. And that just, I think, clicks uh, with, with people a lot more easily. Uh, it's just, of course, coming back to the academic literature, when you say structuralist, you face also this question, whereas if you say post then it's very clear all the line of references behind your work is, is there. I think it has an explanatory power to people who would know this literature. And structuralist, though, does have, I think, um, uh, slightly more helpful connotations, though these people don't know what structuralist could be. I mean, I have slides when I speak to these audience what I mean by structuralist elements, what I mean by gendered futures in this macro model. Um, something to think about, I think, for us all. Okay, co coming to the questions that were asked to me, um, what, what, what is the most important policy uh, take home that I'm trying to uh, emphasize? I mean, working with Women's Budget Group in the UK, for us, one biggest thing is to say spending in the care economy is investment in infrastructure. It is social infrastructure investment. So that has to be part of your industrial policy. That has to be part of your ring-fenced key spending uh, elements. It's not just about bridges and mortar. It is about spending in human capabilities. Uh, I mean, that's a very uh, clear uh, idea in feminist economics, but bringing it home and trying to do all this um, tedious work that people like Sophie have been trying to do, really, to show empirically, this does actually enhance productivity. <laughs> We're not theorizing it. And something that has tortured me a lot is, I do believe, investing in general in infrastructure should stimulate productivity, but we fail to find that positive effect um, of physical infrastructure spending. There is very clearly something that is taken for granted, but it isn't working. It, I mean, Sophie spent a good part of her summer trying to find positive effect of physical infrastructure spending on productivity for 
19 European countries, we failed to find it for you know, a year or more for the UK. It is, uh, it is about how you spend the money as well. But okay, so this, this was one thing very important to me. The other important message is, of course, uh, there are massive uh, investment needs in the care economy and in the green economy. You, as the public sector, have to lead that investment in both. And it's not a competition that the green is now uh, in everyone's mind, and then care economy is being forgotten. No, you have to invest in both. And there is money to invest in both. Well, there is the good multiplier effect, self-financing effect of public spending, but it isn't Alice in Wonderland. You've got to also uh, tax. In the short run, borrowing is, of course, okay. There are other institutions you can tap into, but there is one big untaxed pool of uh, resource for you. It is well taxation. I think this is the other uh, message, and I feel both humbled but also empowered by the recent political saga in Britain about you know, how the right-wing version MMT failed so spectacularly in terms of cutting taxes, but deficit uh, finance uh, triggered a, such a market reaction was interesting. So, well, taxation of wealth uh, could have sorted it, but it's up to us, of course, not uh, the, the conservative governments to do that. Financialization literature uh, and market concentration literature in the intersection of um, explaining how wealth concentration might uh, have negative effects on private investment. Um, uh, there is a literature that we cite in the paper, there is a working paper version online um, that you can uh, check. The paper itself is under review in a journal that I won't name, not feminist economics, but who takes a lot of time <laughs> to reply. Uh, people might uh, have some ideas here, but okay. <laughs> that, uh, as opposed to feminist yeah, economics, yeah. so it's very uh, quick, by the way. The, the, the literature that we cite on the financialization side is, uh, what we are saying is wealth concentration leads to financialization, because a lot of that wealth in the top 1% is actually being uh, stored in financial assets. Uh, and there's some uh, literature around that as well. And then the negative effect of financialization on investment is well evidenced by firm level post-Keynesian research, Özgür Orhan Gazi, I know he's here, I don't see him now in the audience, but uh, he has done a lot of work on that. Uh, Fırat Demir, um, uh, Daniele Tori, formerly at Greenwich, uh, I myself with him, have uh, done work on that. On the, um, again, wealth effect side, not concentration, but Engelbert, uh, Stockhammer and colleagues have done work that size, um, firms might react to assets versus liabilities differently and if both are increasing, but if firms react to the liabilities negatively and more strongly than their reaction to assets, again, um, there might be negative effects uh, of wealth on investment, so that might be happening uh, in, in the background. And on the market concentration side, there is more mainstream literature, of course, uh, Guterres and Philippon that show that market concentration creates barriers to entry, reduces investments, uh, incentives uh, for investment uh, and innovation. So these are the references that you can find in the paper. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll take the questions in reverse order. I mean, the, the environment issue has come up twice. I thought it was on my laundry list. It was supposed to be, and if it wasn't, then I apologize for that, because obviously that is a significant aspect of uh, capacity, as it were, regardless of uh, the generation of demand. So that was just an oversight from the, the laundry list. As to why I didn't dwell on it today, well, it, of course, in the space of 20 minutes, I was trying to lean into the gender topic specifically. So. Uh, obviously, nothing I've said precludes many other things as well that may ultimately be important here. Uh, that includes finance. I would associate that actually as being a principal importance in demand formation. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the literatures that um, I highlighted does in fact uh, take seriously the finance, uh, financing of demand and explore uh, the uh, steady state implications of uh, debt buildup. Uh, I didn't dwell on that today again because of the time constraint and leading towards it. But that's a roundabout way of saying, yeah, that's, that obviously is important 
important too. Uh, I think we've done with structuralism and Lance. So the elasticity of substitution. Well, you know, uh, evidence is debatable as well, isn't it? And I think what you make of the evidence and what you then think are sensible first approximations is the issue here. So you've talked about some econometric evidence. Uh, I would encourage you as a compliment to that to, you know, uh, Read, for example, Nathan Rosenberg and people who've written about the history of technology, you, you get quite a different perspective, I think, from reading those accounts. Uh, and I think the other thing to remember as well is we're talking here about, you know, in the process of abstracting, we're simplifying. So the point of the Leontief function is not to insist on a literally zero uh, um, elasticity of substitution. It's to suggest that we're approximating a world where that elasticity is low. Okay, a simple example. Uh, consider a tractor. It's engineered to be driven by one person. And again, Rosenberg and others, the literature is replete with examples like this. Consider adding a second person. Well, if you are plowing a field and there are rocks in it, maybe the second person could walk ahead of the tractor and pick up the rocks and chuck them out of the way, and that would prevent the wheel from coming off occasionally. So there'd be a marginal product of labor, and you would have some kind of adjustability there of the capital labor ratio. Now add 20 workers. I would suggest what you've got is two, a tractor and a plow, two workers, and 20 spectators plowing a field. And so, so what is it we're approximating? And I, and I think that's the other aspect of this, is choosing an abstraction that ine inevitably then simplifies in what you think is the best first approximation. Okay. Thanks for that. We have very little time for a second round of questions, but three questions or so we might be able to face. If there is appetite for questions as opposed to appetite for dinner. Okay, I have one. The appetite for dinner seems to outweigh the appetite for questions. Go ahead. Um, Hi, uh, I am David Cano from the University of Siena. My question is for uh, Elisa Brownstein. Uh, I was thinking if the notion of social reproduction can be extended beyond the, the mere care, uh, care work in the households, and in particular to what in the Global South we call informal activities, and all these survival activities, because uh, you put it in terms of uh, it's the work needed to reproduce the, global, the, the labor force. But when people cannot find a job, um, they have to, they have to uh, provide their own livelihoods on, with different activities, sometimes in uh, familiar enterprises and all, all kinds of different types of work that are more for survival reasons than for profit or accumulation. Okay, thank you. I have Raphael there. Anyone else who would? Raphael? Thank you. Raphael Wilder, University of Greenwich. My question is to Özlem and Elisia, because in Elisia's presentation, we saw the, the two by two matrix of, of possible regimes and um, to what extent we are in a kind of equality-led world where uh, gender equality is, is beneficial in, in any aspect or in kind of the more um, less desirable places. And then you, you did the empirical work and, and showed that, um, well, it's uh, not that great. <laughs> um, and and in, in contrast, we, uh, Uslam, your, your work on, on uh, the uh, uh, Europe and and but you also did did uh, more global uh, studies. You, you, you s your results point us to a much more equality driven driven world, right? Um, the two questions there: um, How do we reconcile these these two kind of findings? Um, and what I since you spent a lot of time thinking about these questions, the, the key policies we need to engage in in order to move towards uh, that better place, the, the top right corner. Um, the, I don't know, the, the one or the top three list uh, you, you would suggest. Thank you. Okay, last call for questions. Yes, in the first or second row, if you have the final question.
Um, hello, uh, Luca Gavron from uh, Leipzig University. Um, this is probably more political theory question to Elisa, but um, your analysis of uh, feminism reminded me a lot of uh, Nancy Fraser, for example, or uh, Rahel Yagi, and their um, assumption is more or less well these um, um, structures they are so well established into capitalism we I don't know have to overcome the system or we have to you know uh, think of ways on how a socialism would look like or something and I was wondering if your conception of this uh, high road care led economy for example or regime would also demand a I don't know, would demand to overcome the system, if you would call it that way, or do you think that these uh, necessary changes can be achieved in our current social economic system via fiscal policy or, yeah, some changes? <laughs> Okay, thanks for that. I have to add one brief follow-up on Raphael's question for Elisa. Elisa, the way you construct your measurements of the regimes, isn't it the case that you're essentially saying, if I have a high principle component, it's more likely that it's uh, inequality-led, but do you actually have an absolute standard on whether it is ultimately an increase in, in female wages would have a positive or negative effect on demand. My, my reading is you, you don't, but maybe you want to clarify. Okay, uh, I suggest we go in inverse order if Mark wants to comment on any of the questions. But for all three of you, I have to say, uh, Sabine is there reminding us that we actually have to go to dinner. So I would ask you to keep it short and sharp and don't forget that we have to socially reproduce it it's ourselves at the dinner. <laughs> okay, then. Oh, I'm in the middle. But we keep so it short. Yeah, oh, um, in terms of regimes, uh, Rafael, we have um, also a two by two uh, matrix in a way uh, wage led, profit led, uh, demand regime, and um, gender equality led versus gender inequality led uh, demand regime. Um, and you can be actually in any of the cells in terms of two by two. One doesn't lead to the other. And if you're both wage-led and gender equality-led, we call it equality-led. Now, our um, estimations for the UK in the gendered model or in the ungendered uh, other models for uh, the US, Japan, and some uh, 15 European countries, Turkey, Korea, other emerging economies, are very strictly based on Estimations of parameters for components of demand, you know, consumption, investment, exports, or imports, uh, price equations, um, so, uh, and then sometimes sub-periods of these equations and then turning the estimated parameters to marginal effects. Um, that's, uh, I think, quite a different methodology than uh, what um, Elisa and colleagues are uh, doing. Uh, we, in our research, tend to find that large economies are wage-led. Uh, there are small open economies in the emerging world uh, that are not uh, wage-led in isolation. But then the other thing that is very clear to me is um, you might be forgiven for thinking you are wage profit-led in isolation, but when all countries do the same, very few countries can grow out of a race to the bottom uh, in wages. Um, is, is what I learned in all this sort of decade of that work. In terms of, uh, I mean, that goes to also Sophie's question in the first round that we had forgotten. Um, how do you move across regimes? Obviously, uh, what if you're stuck in an uh, economy that we claim to be profit-led? Well, those parameters can change. It's about A, the structure of the economy, B, uh, genuine public industrial policy and investment that changes both the structure and investment behavior as well as exports elasticity to prices, to world income. I mean, uh, climbing up those stairs uh, is possible. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of public investment uh, or 
in general industrial policy tools beyond public investment, but you can do it by the public sector reading the way of increasing wages and employment, in my opinion, and that's going to change our parameters and the regime that you're stuck in, uh, hopefully will be changed to an equality-led regime. Yeah. Thanks for that. Elisa? I'll make this quick. Thanks for your questions. Um, in, in terms of the first one, in, for uh, informal sector work, as you say, is very significant, right, in certain countries. The model is, and the model can accommodate that. The key feature, though, is that it's not just about low productivity work. It's specifically, you know, it's specified in terms of the production of labor, right? So work that goes directly into the production of labor. So earning a, a living um, in order to, you know, selling things in the, in the market, for instance, and engaging in informal sector work in order to earn money to buy food to... Uh, contribute to the household, it's that that would be considered a commodity input into care, right? Because you're generating income. So it is, it's, it's a constraint, I think, and a strength of the model in the sense that we are very specifically talking about activities or commodities that go directly into the production of labor, and that's the notion of the social reproduction. Um, but it can be applied in different economic structures. I'm going to try to make this short here. How, I mean, and, and in terms of do we need to take apart capitalism, essentially, to overcome patriarchy? You know, I, I see patriarchy as a parallel, as an independent system, right, that coexists with capitalism. And there are ways that capitalism has uh, really challenged traditional patriarchal sources of power, but there are ways that it is also reconstituted um, in new ways, right, sources of patriarchal power and hierarchies. And so um, I think it's probably necessary, but not sufficient, because uh, we've seen, right, examples of so socialism uh, where it, patriarchy reconstitutes itself in the context of uh, those relations, social relations of production. So it's a great hard question. Uh, in terms of how to move to a more egalitarian world, I think that um, Oslam has been addressing it. One of the things that we uncovered in this work on the empirical side is the importance of the sort of race to the bottom and the macro structural constraints on the demand side, that even if you have a commitment to a strong social welfare regime on the supply side, the sort of global conditions and the pressures for the race to the bottom can really undermine those commitments because of this contradiction between the demand and supply sides of the economy. Can, can I make a <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, no, I'm, I'm afraid we have to close because we actually have to, we're in I, I'm afraid we're in Germany and we have to go in a punctual fashion to dinner. So with that, a big thank you for our speakers.